Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am super excited for this event this evening. This is Left Bank Books welcomes acclaimed chef and best-selling author Julia Tertian, who will discuss her new cookbook, Simply Julia, 101, 110 Easy Recipes for Healthy Comfort Food. Tertian will be in conversation with author and New Yorker writer Gia Tolentino. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Julia and Tia, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world even, so you can have this book sent to all of your friends. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoyed this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for all of your friends at left-bank.com. And I will show you this beautiful signature. It is gorgeous. Purchasing a signed copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you for your support. We need your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So please type your questions as a comment. And you can do that at any point in time throughout the event. Be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. We have so many incredible events already lined up for the year and are adding events daily. About tonight's book, Simply Julia. Beloved New York Times best-selling cookbook author Julia Tertian returns with her first collection of recipes featuring a healthier take on the simple, satisfying comfort food for which she's known. Julia Tertian has always been cooking. As a kid, she skipped the easy bake oven and went straight to the real thing. Throughout her life, cooking has remained a constant, and as fans of her popular books know, Julia's approach to food is about so much more than putting dinner on the table. It's about love, community, connection, and nourishment of the body and soul. In Simply Julia, readers will find 110 foolproof recipes for more nutritious takes on the simple comforting meals Julia cooks most often. With practical chapters such as weeknight go-tos, make-ahead mains, vegan one-pot meals, chicken recipes, easy baked goods, and more, Simply Julia provides endlessly satisfying options comprised of accessible and affordable ingredients. Think dishes like stewed chicken with sour cream and chive dumplings, Hasselbeck carrots with smoked paprika, and lemon ricotta cupcakes, the kind of flavorful yet unfussy food everyone wants to make at home. In addition to her tried and true recipes, readers will find Julia's signature elements, her seven lists, seven things I learned from being a private chef that make home cooking easier, seven ways to use leftover buttermilk, seven ways to use leftover egg whites or egg yolks, menu suggestions and helpful adaptations for dietary needs, along with personal essays and photos and gorgeous food photography. Like Melissa Clark's dinner or Ina Garten's modern comfort food, Simply Julia is sure to become an instant classic the kind of cookbook that will inspire home cooks to create great meals for years to come. Jennifer Garner says, Julia Turchin clearly lays out simple techniques and then encourages us to learn them and let go and dance our way through our kitchens with confidence. With an intuitive layout, intimate wisdom, and aspirational yet achievable meals, Simply Julia is a beautiful, next-level, parent-friendly cookbook that will have a prime position on my counter for a long time to come. And Nigella Lawson, who sneak we will be hosting, uh, says a new book by Julia Tertian makes the heart lift. About tonight's speakers, Julia Tertian is the best-selling author of Now and Again, Amazon's best cookbook of 2018, and an NPR great read. Feed the Resistance, Eater's Best Cookbook of 2017, and Small Victories, named one of the best cookbooks of 2016 by the New York Times and NPR. She also hosts the IACP-nominated podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On. She has co-authored numerous cookbooks and has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Vogue, Bon Appetit, 
uh, food and wine and more. Epicurious has called her one of the 100 greatest home cooks of all time. And the New York Times has described her at the forefront of the next generation of authentic, approachable authors. She sits on the Kitchen Cabinet Advisory Board for the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and is the founder of Equity at the Table, an inclusive digital directory of women and non-binary individuals in food. She lives in the Hudson Valley with her wife and their dogs. And tonight, Julia will be in conversation with Gia Tolentino. Gia is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Raised in Texas, she studied at the University of Virginia before serving in Kyrgyzstan in the Peace Corps and receiving her MFA in fiction from the University of Michigan. She was a contributing editor at The Hairpin and the deputy editor at Jezebel, and her work has appeared in The New York Times, Magazine, Grantland, Pitchfork, and other publications. She lives in Brooklyn and is the author of the wildly critically acclaimed essay, Trick Mirror. And now, I am so happy and proud that you are here and that you will help me welcome for the evening Julia Tertian and Gia Tolentino for Left Think Books. If you could please help me give them a round of applause as I bring <laughs> them onto the screen. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shane. I'm, I'm very just, I want to hire you to read my emails out to me. <laughs> that was like so comforting. I'm game. Yeah. <laughs> Um, hello to everyone that we can't see. It's I still haven't gotten used to this strange thing where I wish weird. we could see everyone. But happy release day, Julia! Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, yeah celebrating this this birthday with me. I feel like yeah, this is the birthday party. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm grateful for your time. And I love talking to you about cooking and books and writing and. So this is so great. I've been looking forward to this. And thank you to Left Bank so much. Um, I'm just so happy that part of being an author means getting to know people who run stores like Left Bank um, and getting to support them and be supported by them. It's just, it's great. It's like one of the best parts of this funny gig that we both find ourselves in. So thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Um can, oh, here we are. <laughs> Where'd you go? Um, I, can I start by asking if the pandemic were not in month 12 right now, yeah. what is the meal that you would want to either eat at a restaurant or be making at a dinner party to celebrate the release of your book? Mm. In a, That's in such a, a fun question. World. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I guess I should cook something from the book, right? But maybe better to have someone cook something from the book and then I can just like drink champagne yeah. and stuff, right? <laughs> so um, what would it be? I guess, uh, let's see, there's so many things I love. Well, I made today um, and then we had it for lunch and then kind of for dinner. There's a kale and mushroom pot pie in the book, which is just like a very cozy thing. It's been pretty cold here. So I love that. And it feels very festive. Like I feel like anytime pest pastry comes out, it's like, Mm -hmm. something special is happening like I feel like you can't be upset and eat puff pastry like it feels yeah. celebratory um yeah so maybe that and one of the cakes which that cakes? would be great I've had my eye on yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there's so there's two well there's there's two like layer cakes like birthday cakes so one is a carrot cake that has like a cream cheese maple frosting that's the one I went to and then there's like a banana chocolate chip cake which I also love I mean, maybe I, both. <laughs> I have to say, you know, um, just before we really get into the conversation, I, like I was saying, I'm already extremely attached to this book. And, you know, one of the things that I was reminded of, I mean, you are one of my favorite voices in the kitchen when I, and it's because, you know, you, you are so, the, your approach to food, not just as a byproduct of labor that requires acknowledging as a sort of locus of justice and injustice, but I think reading this book in month 12 of the pandemic, you know, the way you approach it as food is the sort of narrative center of the people that we've met, that we love, the people we sit down with for a night or for an over and over and over. And these memories that I think kind of sustain us through what have been kind of long and sometimes lonely months. And yeah. um, and you, and it's, it's so, steadying to remember that food will be like that again, right? That it'll mm. 
to be the source of new memories and new dinners we make for people and have other people make for us when we are in need of comfort and care. And um, as I've been telling you, I I can't wait to cook my way through this book. I've already started. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate so much that you you understand both you know, deeply the need to cook in a way that doesn't feel like a burdensome level of effort, but also the pleasure of taking an extra step to make things special. And I, uh, I've been happy to find that I, I made the green chili chicken with pinto beans. Um, and with my baby strapped to my chest, I also made the white pizza style kale. And I was immediately like, I'll be making these over and over and over again. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm sure you've been answering this question a lot and I'm sure you'll answer it a lot on, you know, as you do stuff for this book, but I'm curious, what have you cooked the most in quarantine and have you mm. cooked so much that you've gotten sick of it? Like, <laughs> is anything out of the rotation? Well, first I'll just say, I just, I really appreciate everything you just said and it means a lot to me. And um, there's, there's a store in Hudson, New York, um, called Talbot and Arding, which is this wonderful, like prepared food and sort of cheese store run by two amazing women, um, a married couple, Mona and Kate. And Mona makes, she's an amazing cook. And I once asked her to describe what type of food she makes. And she said she's a narrative cook. And I had never mm -hmm. heard that term before. And I was like, oh, there's a word for this. <laughs> like, and hearing what you just said, just like reminded me of that. And um, I don't know, it just made me feel good. And I wanted to share that because I do think. You think of yourself in the same way? I think so. Yeah. Um, Cause I think that everything we eat is tied to something and there's stories with it and it's how I remember things. But to answer your question, um, in terms of what I've made the most, I would say, well, it's not in the book. <laughs> But um, I think the thing that Grace, my wife, and I have probably consumed the most over the last year is probably matzo brai, which is also known as fried matzo. Uh, if anyone is not familiar with this, if you didn't grow up in like a Jewish household, specifically like an Ashkenazi Jewish household, it's um, so you take a matzo cracker and you break it up and you like soak it for a little bit in warm water, just like under the tap. And then, so once it's a little bit soft, you mix it with beaten eggs and you like fry it in butter. So it's like stretching out eggs. Um, and it was something that I ate when I was growing up. It was one of the only things my mom ever cooked. My mom like very, very rarely cooked, but it was one of the things she made kind of like a weekend breakfast thing. Um, and Grace has come to love it, did not grow up with it, but it's been this like really sweet, surreal thing of like this childhood favorite comfort food of mine has become something she really loves and she now makes and you know so to have my wife make my like favorite comfort food from when I was a kid like it's just really sweet but it's also I think part of the reason we make it so much is it's made of matzo and eggs and a little butter it's like things that are very easy to keep around super cheap it's really quick and it's just like very satisfying and just like when we can't think of anything else or have no energy to do anything else it's just like it's reliable yeah but I don't think it's out of the repertoire. We're still eating it. I don't know if I've gotten sick of anything. That's good. I, I love wonder. to hear it. <laughs> I know Grace is listening. I can hear it in the other room. So she can text me if she yeah, um, Grace can text you anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you wrote in the book, you filed the first draft of this in February of last year, right? And you mm -hmm. were photographing things throughout the early spring. And what, I mean, now that it's, uh, you know, almost a year has passed, when you think about that period, like how did the cookbook fit into the emotions of last spring in New York? Like sure. what was the emotional tenor of that work at that time? Yeah, it's so interesting you ask that because this morning I had the um, very, you know, privileged experience and unusual opportunity of getting to go like on a morning news show to demonstrate something, but I did it like out of my kitchen, like on Zoom, like we're doing now. And, you know, the whole thing was like three minutes, but I took like three hours to prepare and I like made all these different things and stuff. And I realized I I was so stressed out last night and I was like, oh, I think I'm having some PTSD from shooting the photos of this book, which was like a wonderful experience, but it was stressful because of the timing. So as you mentioned, I turned in the manuscript in February of 2020. And so the manuscript for a cookbook is all the words, it's all the recipes, 
all of the introductions for the recipes. Um, you know, I wrote some essays in this book. So it's all of that. And by that point, all the recipes were tested. So the like kind of longest part of making the book, in some ways, the hardest part of making the book was done. And the only thing that wasn't done were the photographs, which is an intense thing to make happen, but it happens usually a lot faster than all that writing. And I was planning to photograph it, um, yeah, in March 2020. And I was planning to work uh, with a team of people, which I've done in the past. Um, we were going to turn my kitchen, which I'm sitting, you know, in right now. I'm sitting at the kitchen table where you have sat, Gia, which is like <laughs> such a nice memory. <laughs> I know. Well, I, have, I just dropped the book. I have to say for everyone listening, I mean, I, Julie and I are about 30 minutes away from each other upstate. And you know, you once, like you really did change my life. You once, Julia once invited me over for lunch while I was upstate on a solo writing trip, writing my book. And, you know, we, we had never met in person and this, you know, coming to this kitchen table, I remember it was sunny and you made the chicken and leeks from small victories with creme fraiche at the end. And I, I you know, that night I was back to my little like rented room in Kingston and I called my boyfriend and I was like, should we find a house upstate that we can fix up? And I have you to thank for this, you know, this, the situation that I'm in, which I've been like almost painfully grateful for this past year to not have to, you know, our apartment in Brooklyn has, has four seats in the entire place. Like I, it's been, what a gift. Anyway, back to this yeah. kitchen. No, I mean, our goal is just to like, like I'm looking at you. I'm like it's, you're also placed almost exactly where you are on the cover. <laughs> and I told Gia that my, I don't know where to point um, my copy of the book that I have is just hiding the side of our toaster oven. I'm like trying to be a prop stylist. But anyway, so the, yeah, the photography portion I've normally done in my home because my goal with all my work is for it to feel like it's coming from my kitchen to yours. So I was gonna have a team of people in my home um, and that very quickly felt like not a safe thing to do, not a responsible thing to do and not a necessary or urgent or important thing to do. You know, this was like early March 2020, like New York State had just gone into lockdown. Um, we knew so little. Um, and so I was ready to just post it on the book. It just felt like, you know, there are literal obvious emergencies going on. Like a cookbook is not an emergency. <laughs> it is not necessary. Like it can wait. And then I remembered I live like 10 minutes away from this like pretty amazing the person, Melina Hammer, who is a gifted um, photographer, food stylist, so she makes food look good, and prop stylist, meaning she would probably do something better with this book toaster of this situation. Um, it's very rare to find someone who can do, you know, two out of three of those things. Usually someone specializes in one, and she is very gifted at all three. And we, I reached out to her. She was game and um, we basically took like a month to shoot the book and I would prepare everything at home, label all these containers, put in like a packet of notes with like inspiration pictures of like, I love the angle of this. And, you know, we've already shot three overhead in this chapter, like all this stuff. We put it in a box, put it on her doorstep. She took it inside and she took it from there. And then we texted all day, like, do you want the blue napkin or the light blue napkin? You know, on and on. And it was just the two of us, no other people working on it. I mean, we both have incredibly supportive spouses who did many dishes and, you know, like gave shoulder massages. Um, but that was it. And it was, you know, a shoot, a photo shoot, unlike any I've ever done. And we wanted to only do it if we felt like we could make a product, you know, make photographs we were really happy with, which, which we did. And it was really like an unbelievable exercise and just very direct and decisive communication, um, which I value and which is something I think we've all had to do in different ways during this time mm -hmm. and something I really value. But yeah, in terms of responding to the pandemic, that was like the most obvious and logistic one. But in terms of me having like that PTSD, it was like I was planning for, you know, tomorrow's shoot, but she's shooting something today. And I'm also getting ingredients and trying not to go into any stores. And it was just like, right. I felt like I was on like a reality show or something. <laughs> like it was just like, how many restrictions can we put on this thing? But we were able to pull it off. And, you know, I'm grateful that I was able to, um, to work, you know, during the pandemic and to have something that gave me a sense of purpose. I'm grateful I was able to give, you know, her that work. And we had that collaborative experience and, I'm just extremely grateful because it allowed me to keep the book on schedule, which isn't 
the most important thing, but it does mean, you know, it's coming out now today, <laughs> birthday party. And it means it is coming out kind of at the year anniversary of this time. And, you know, I didn't know when I started working on the book, what would be happening now, of course, but I do think it is pretty, um, I don't know. I think it's a very useful book always, but I think especially right now. So I'm, I'm grateful we were able to stick to that schedule. Did I answer your question? Yes, 100%. <laughs> I, was, I think it is It is a really useful book for now. And I actually, I mean, as when we came up here, I brought both your other cookbooks because I think one of the things that you're, you know, you're, you, you make a point of using things that people can get at most grocery stores. And you mm -hmm. guys already make most of your meals at home, right? And, and so there are, they are kind of guidebooks to the way that you should be cooking when you are kind of at home and you don't have as many options. And one of the things that I, I forget what section it is, but you have a short list of, you know, like five things you do, I think, to make the kitchen, you know, to like mm -hmm. up the vibes, I think, as you mm -hmm. put it. And I think I, the pandemic has been a season for me to start doing these things, you know, because previously, I, Andrew and I would rare my boyfriend and I would rarely be eating together. It would be at mm -hmm. you know nine fifteen. Like I'm like sending my emails and you know I and this year I have become you know a cloth napkin person. I light candles even when I'm scarfing down a bowl of pasta by myself. Like mm -hmm. I you know earlier tonight, it's still I didn't realize how much those little tiny good kitchen vibe things matter. Um, or would matter. And mm -hmm. you guys, have you, I was wondering if you've added any new ones in the pandemic mm. to further up your already very good kitchen vibes. <laughs> uh, I love that question. Yeah, I mean, that was a list I include. There's a lot of lists in the book. I love lists of things. They make me feel secure in a very uncertain world. Um, and yeah, that one includes like using a cloth napkin, um, you know, putting on music in terrible. your kitchen. Yeah, like I mean, and it's the only, like that sounds very like I don't know maybe a little fancy or something, but it's I mean it's like the only thing I do. Like there's no tablecloth. Like I don't like that's great. You light the candles. I rarely remember to do something like that, but it is just this. You know the difference between eating with a real napkin and a paper towel. Like I think it's just a like I don't we don't I could get carried away with this, but I think it's just about kind of what I think the core of this book is, which is about being kind to ourselves and taking care of ourselves and taking care of the people around us. Um, but starting with ourselves, like hearing you sat down, scarf the bowl of pasta, but you lit the candle for yourself. Like, yeah. I think it's just like a moment of pause, like a gesture. So in terms of other things, have I added to that list? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to tilt my computer down for a second <laughs> so you can see it's sitting on a puzzle. Well, I've eaten many puzzles. <laughs> because I'm the jerk who bought a ring light on Amazon because I was like, my things are at night, but I don't really know how to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, have my, I have my bedside reading lamp pointed right at my face. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, But we have been doing so many puzzles on our kitchen table. And I feel like Grace and I have started pretty much every morning for the last couple of months. We both make our coffee we have different ways of doing our coffee so we both take care of ourselves our own needs and then and sometimes she makes mine which is like the nicest thing in the world and then we sit down here and we listen to our news podcast and we do it while we're working on the puzzle and sometimes we have other meals around the puzzle and it's just become I don't know I like not to you know I don't know if anyone coming to a talk about a cookbook like planned to hear about like, I don't know, the riot at the Capitol. <laughs> but like that day, I remember we had the news on, we were both on our phones and it was just, you know, so like intense to take in all this information. And then I immediately went to our puzzle because we always have one going and I could listen to it, but I couldn't watch it. I was like too stressed out and I felt like, I had no more usefulness because my like all my ends were afraid. But if I sit with the puzzle, it's like my hands are busy. I have to like focus on this thing. I feel like it's like taking a walk and talking to someone. Like usually it's like a really good conversation because your like body is occupied. It's like cooking with someone and then the conversation that leads to. So the puzzle for me has been definitely a great addition to our good vibes. So yeah, I'll add that. You were saying that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to talk about your definition of healthy here, which I love. Mm -hmm. And it 
comports exactly with how I think of health, which is you know, like what will holistically make you feel good, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with traditional markers often. And I was, I was wondering about, you know, that, like, was that central to your conception of this book from the beginning that you wanted to write a book kind of around this idea of care and yeah. satisfaction? Yeah. Um, so I think I, I'm so happy you brought this up because this is just so important to me. Um, so yeah, the subtitle of this book is, you know, recipes for healthy comfort food. Um, and I, was very intentional about using those words. And I think both those words, healthy and comfort, are words that tend to get overused a lot in, you know, cookbooks and just food packaging, you know, like menus and stuff, like anywhere where there's words printed and they're trying to sell you something about food, including cookbooks. Like I think those two words get overused a lot to the point of like not having that much meaning. And sometimes having a pretty dangerous meaning. Like I think a lot of things that are billed as healthy are m more like restrictive yeah. eating, disordered eating in disguise, you know, and this book, Simply Julia is very much about being open to many different, many definitions of what does healthy mean? What does comfort mean? What do those words mean together? And for me, my definition is one that is just truly evolving and at this moment in time, I feel like it's very much, it has so little to do with, you know, anything that can be counted with numbers, like calories or fiber or anything like that, like nothing about that. It has everything to do with how I feel and how I feel when I'm cooking, when I'm eating. And mostly it comes back to me when I feel like my healthiest, I feel deeply connected. And that could be with, you know, Grace, we're sitting next to each other doing the puzzle and eating breakfast. Like that feels healthy to feel that connected to my wife, like while we're having a meal. You know, I feel really healthy when I feel um, connected to, you know, we, I live in a rural area. We live near a lot of farms. I know a lot of farmers. I get to eat things grown by people, like cared for by people that I know, and it feels so connected. And that to me is very much within this definition. But in terms of like, did I start out? with this plan, like, it's interesting because my previous book, I went into both Small Victories and Now and Again, I knew the titles of those books, I knew, like, the whole framework of those books, like, I had the whole vision so clear, like, those books, if you, ma if you look at the next to my book proposals, like, they match. Yeah. Th this book really evolved over time. Um, it wasn't so clear to me. I didn't know I didn't know exactly what it would be, but the, you use the word care. And that was very clear to me. I, I think at one point I was like, I came up with like a hundred titles for this book, like really bad titles. And like, I think one was like, I got like care. a couple of bad ones. In. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think care was always very central to me. And I think at first it was like, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff within my community and stuff. And I was like, I think, when you know, I wrote a few book proposals for this. I was really like throwing so many darts at the board. Like I knew something was there, but I didn't quite know what. It felt like the kernel was covered in all these other layers that I had to like, you know, peel apart. And I think at first I started with this idea of a book about like um, doing things that are very outward, like taking care of other people, like you know, what to make for your neighbors or something. Which which this book is. I mean, every cookbook is. You know, you can drop off whatever. <laughs> um, but I think it evolved into like, how do we take care of ourselves? And for me, how do I take care of myself? Because historically I haven't done a great job of that. Like I've, I've, I've been really good at taking care of a lot of other people's needs, anticipating them, responding to them before they even know they have them. You know, I worked for a long time as a private chef, which that is sort of the definition of that job. Um, I take so much pride in like remembering things my friends or family love and making it for them. Um, you know, I've written many books about cooking at home and I've done that for so many other people and over the past few years and coinciding with writing this book I've done that for myself more than ever and I my relationship to myself like my literally myself my body <laughs> has changed a lot for the better and it it's become just like a much more positive and a much more loving relationship and I think a lot of those changes coincided with writing this book. And I think it's, you know, it was, it's, it's really nice for me to open it now and look back and like have this kind of time capsule of this pretty kind of, I don't know, 
transformative time in my life where I think that I just chose to do the work of like deciding to take better care of myself and you know to to share that because I think there's there's a lot of logistics there that I think can be really helpful for people like whether you know it could be as simple as like use frozen spinach in in something you're cooking because that might you know get you to have a meal on the table faster like do yourself a favor like take a shortcut like from that simple to like you know in a in an essay about all this like talking about you know therapy and all these other things that are you know deeper and you know less about your freezer <laughs> but I feel like the book is full of these sort of takeaways about how yeah how to take better care of yourself and have a healthier relationship with yourself yeah it's um there there's this real there's such a like an obvious thoughtfulness in the book about like you wanted people to feel good as they cook, not just as they eat that, you know, you want people to feel competent and easy and in control and, and flexible, like kind of all of these things that we want to feel in all other areas of life. Yeah. And yeah. The, you know, the, I was actually the essay that was, the if people listening haven't read it, it was excerpted on Healthyish today, mm -hmm. right? The essay you yeah, wrote in the book yeah. about your changing relationship to your body and like reading it, I was incredibly moved because it is a beautiful, wonderful essay. But because you are so clearly so good at, like you said, anticipating other people's needs, that you know, I think it kind of came as somewhat of a surprise to me that you know that it, it's so strange how your whole self can be about something. Mm -hmm. And you can be so good at it for other people. And somehow, you know, we can still withhold these bits of thoughtfulness and kindness and grace from ourselves. Yeah. And yeah, and, and you know, there, there's a line in it that you you wrote, like you realize you'd only ever felt two things in your life, happy mm -hmm. or fat. And then you know, it was like a light bulb when you realized that was mm -hmm. the case and the paradigm that you could, you know, start breaking within yourself. And I was wondering if you had felt the, I, I read that and I was like, a lot of people are gonna respond really strongly to this. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you had felt that today and as the essay went up. Yeah, um, yes, <laughs> I I don't know. I feel like I'm having trouble like completing sentences tonight and I'm realizing, I think, I don't know if that's coming off, but I feel a little, I'm just being like very Not honest in this moment. <laughs> like I, I think I'm a little overwhelmed because in a really good way, in the best way possible, because I, I don't know, I've never received this many DMs in my life as I did today, like sharing this essay and it, it feels really powerful. And yeah, maybe just to add a little context, because um, thank you for like knowing that they excerpted it on the website on healthyish. Um, but for anyone who hasn't read it, I know the book just came out. Like, I don't expect that anyone has read it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> read it you know I mean? Like, to me, it's like old news, right? Yeah. Um, but so this essay is very much about, um, yeah, just having this, basically throughout the book, I, I use the word healthy here and there. It, you know, it's sprinkled in different places. Um, I'm always talking about kind of what it means and, you know, how I see it in this recipe, because I consider every recipe in the book to be healthy because every recipe in the book makes me feel good when I cook and when I eat. I love that distinction you brought up because it's really important. Um, and I can, I'll put that idea over here and I can get back to it. But the essay is on the worthiness of our bodies is the title. I was going to call it happier fat and then I, whatever, anyway. Um, and it's just a reflection on all these things we're talking about and all the, these things that I appreciate you asking me. And it's this incredibly honest and very vulnerable reflection on my own experience with my body and how I lived with a lot of just disordered eating habits for a really long time. And I lived very much in um, direct service, I would say, to diet culture. It was something I grew up in. It was something I practiced. I wanted to be like the hardest working, <laughs> like best at it. And it was something I preached. It was in a lot of my work. Um, and that was all the case because I honestly had no idea there were other options. I just thought like, oh, that's the air we breathe. Like I didn't realize like there's other air. Um, and so this essay really digs into all that and kind of like how I just sort of figured that out, which was, uh, you know, a combination of many things. Um, 
a few things off the top of my mind, my incredible wife, who is incredibly supportive, and I think saw these possibilities for me before I even knew that. And a lot of therapy with all different types of therapists, which I like could talk about all day, love therapy. Um, and so I really just kind of dug into it because I just felt like if I'm going to write a book that's about healthy food, I just really want to be very honest. And mostly because I just think healthy has been used as a substitute for skinny for so long. And I just think that's damaging and dangerous. And I just wanted to just push really firmly against that. Um, so in sharing that essay in the book and then today on um, Bon Appetit's website, you know, which I guess reached a lot of people, I I have felt how connected that feels. And it honestly feels amazing because, you know, I spent most of my life feeling all the ways I was just describing and feeling pretty kind of low about myself and feeling honestly like I was failing all the time. I was on and off of Weight Watchers for years. I'm counting everything. I still have trouble not calculating things. And those numbers don't equate with like what your body actually wants or needs. So I always felt like I wasn't doing a good job. And those feelings suck. <laughs> and they left me often feeling like very lonely. I could be surrounded by people. I could be at a party. I could be at a table with my closest friends. And I would be calculating points in my head. And I would just feel so lonely. And in sharing this essay, I, just, I feel like the answer I keep responding to everyone with is like, you're not alone. You're not alone. Like, I feel so connected to so many people and it feels really powerful. And it just feels like, you know, it feels scary to include something so vulnerable. I mean, you've included so much personal stuff in your work. Like, I know that you know this, but it's to put it out there is a very vulnerable thing. And to have it received, not just warmly, but with like a lot of honesty and compassion from other people is like an incredibly powerful thing that I think I'm just barely soaking it in right now. And I feel overwhelmed, as I mentioned, in the best possible way. And it's, it feels amazing. And it feels really amazing to me that every time I've talked about this book with anyone, like including you, this has come up. And I like, I can talk about white pizza kale all day. It's like the best recipe. I love it so much. So but I'm, so, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad I get to have this conversation because I just think about a friend of mine gave the book to her teenage daughter to read and was telling me about what it meant for her to have her daughter reading it. And I was just so moved by that. And I just think about like, what if I was 14 watching two writers, you know, women like in their thirties talk about this, like what would that have meant to me at that age? And here we are. Yeah. How much energy bypass. Yeah. There is something, I know this feeling very, like it is, it's always strange to be reminded again and again that any sort of anxiety or compulsion or neurosis or worry that you have, like I all like they're so isolating. And then you write about them, you're like, oh, actually, like mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking it a million other people have thought it about yeah. their lives. And I'm I'm glad, but it I could imagine the, the feeling you kind of feel like kind of your skin is evaporating a little bit. You feel very yeah. like uh, yeah, exposed. Like exposed, totally, totally. Uh, and it's also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I have anything else to say. It's very powerful. <laughs> it's such a good essay. I have, everyone will, yeah, it's 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 wonderful. And so before we go to audience questions, I just have one more. The the oh other God, thing, um, there's a there's a list section at the end. You know, the, one of the lists is seven things you learned from being a private chef. And mm -hmm. I loved it because, you know, as as I'm sure this was, like they are all, they're basically all rules to live by generally. And, um, and I, you know, it's like, always think of your future self. If you're buying one, if you're making one chicken, why not make two, you know, why not? Um, there's another one that disclaimers don't taste good, you know, support the people who make the things that you live on, mm -hmm. you know, well, is measured in a lot of different ways. And I think, um, and I just, I appreciated so much that, that this is the way you cook and the way you write cookbooks and the way that, you know, all of the ways that you encourage people to cook are ways that I, I am always trying to help myself live that way too with. Um, and I, and I love that list section. I'm very grateful for it. <laughs> well, I, I just, I really appreciate that. And I guess something I've been reflecting on a lot just in making this book and sharing it, but also just being at home in this kitchen every day um it's just the fact that i mean this sounds really obvious but i just feel like it's worth saying like whether we cook or not food is part of our daily life and if we have 
the you know wonderful thing of enjoying to cook like showing up to hear about a cookbook like i think probably a lot of people here tonight enjoy cooking or want to enjoy cooking you know then it becomes an extra part of your daily life like you're cooking and you're eating and i just don't think there's that many things that on a daily basis give us the ability to both be present and to mm -hmm. also have the experience of providing ourselves with something that gives us pleasure <laughs> and mm -hmm. that we can do that every day is just i don't know it's something that i think i've taken for granted in the past and i just i don't want to anymore and not that i think you have to sit and pause and have some you know meditation or prayer or something before you cook or eat but i just think it's worth just remembering that because I just think it's incredibly powerful. And for me, when I'm present, which I have to be when I cook, right? Because I'm slicing things with a sharp knife, I'm turning on a stove. I'm today I forgot a cobbler in the oven and like I almost burned it, but it turned out fine. But it's like you have to be present, right? And when I'm present, I find that is just the best antidote to anxiety. Because when mm -hmm. I'm anxious, I'm like worried about something that happened or I'm worrying about something that's going to happen. And when I'm present, I, I just find it very hard to be anxious. And the fact that I can access that feeling of being present every day in my kitchen just feels like such a gift to me. And yeah, it's totally what I want other people to feel. I basically just feel like the world is so hard. <laughs> it is so hard. And I just think the kitchen right here is like where I feel most calm, most confident, most resourceful, most creative. Um, it is where I feel like present and not stressed out. And I know it stresses so many people out. So I just want to, everyone to cross that off their list. <laughs> like that is the one list we don't need. Like just the kitchen can be a place of just calm and ease and it doesn't have to be complicated. So that is my like soapbox that I will always stand on. <laughs> <sighs> oh, so happy. <laughs> like. Thank you. Um, I was in the background just like cheering and just being so happy about the words that you were talking about. Um, I want to share a comment uh, first before I ask a question. Uh, but Kathy says, thanks for your vulnerability and all of your beautiful cookbooks. And Eliza says, um, the best comfort food. But I'm going to kick thing, the audience Q&A off with um, kind of my like, when the light bulb hit, when I was reading your cookbook, um, again the lists. I I'm I love lists. I think they are incredible. I loved every list in this book, but the one that I really want to talk about is disclaimers don't taste good, and like that just like hit me really hard. And I was like, you know. I put a lot of work in this and even if it's not exactly what I thought it was going to be, it's food and that food is a gift. And just those powerful words among the many, many others that you write in this book um, really got me like right to the heart. So um, I want to thank you and then also say like, how long did it take for that to really like, kick in for you like mm. well thank you um for sharing that you know not just like that part of the book but your reaction to it um how long did it take me i guess i basically i think that kicked in for me when i've i've just been at a number of friends houses and family members houses i've, I've had the pleasure of sitting at other people's tables and when they have cooked and i've just noticed and it's I hate saying this, but it's just true in my anecdotal research. It's usually women who do the following was well, they will put something down on the table that they have prepared and immediately apologize for it and tell you what it was supposed to be and, you know, how it didn't quite match up to it, you know, whether it didn't look like the picture in the magazine or it's, you know, they were missing an ingredient or whatever. And I also have noticed this on Top Chef. <laughs> I feel like they always, all the contestants, like, put their meals in front of the judges and then like immediately tell them everything that went wrong. And I'm always like, if you just I know. your mouth shut, like you would have like, won. I was like, <laughs> thing, I was like, don't tell them this. <laughs> and so I just like 
saw that happen enough times and I was just kind of like fed up. And I just feel like you don't need to share the whole story. Like, and if something didn't go as planned, okay, like put that in your memory for next time, whatever. But like you made a meal, like that's all you need to know. And that's great. And I just think uh, you also set people up for disappointment if you tell them everything that's wrong with it. And I think that happens a lot with food, but that extends, you know, outside of cooking. So I guess it, I don't know exactly how long that took me, but I guess it's been over the last two years. I, and maybe I just, the straw on the camel's back, you know, I just heard one too many apologies. Uh, Elena is asking, Julia, when you cook at home, do you use recipes or do you freestyle? Um, so I, yes, I, never use recipes when I'm cooking. I I write recipes, but I don't use them. I use them for um, sometimes baking, definitely. Um, but I pretty much never follow a recipe, but I love writing them. And I love giving information and just, I don't know, like support in the kitchen. Like that feels really valuable to me. And there's an essay in the book about, which might seem a little like it doesn't connect, but it, it did for me about how I once went to the singing workshop and that allowed me to understand why recipes are important, even though I think often the goal is to not need them, to be able to just be in the kitchen and whip up something for yourself and not have to stress about it. Like that's how I want people to feel. But my way of supporting you on that journey is to provide recipes. So yeah, I went to the singing workshop, which is like a whole long story. I just like needed to learn to use my voice more and I spent the weekend at this like random place in Massachusetts with people like who I don't know, it was just funny and it like should be like a short film and I was just singing my heart out all weekend and it was an instructor and then like a group of us or a teacher and she um she would sing and we would sing it back to her there was never a piece of paper or anything with like lyrics or music and I did this for like hours and hours and hours. And then I drove home and I came in the door right there, which you can't see, but it's right there. And then um, Grace was like, how was it? And I was like, it was amazing. Like I found my voice. And then she was like, great, like sing me a song. And I was like, can't remember a single one. <laughs> and she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, and I was like racking my brain. I was like, I can't remember. And she was like, but I thought like you enjoyed it. I was like, I did. I had the best time. It was so empowering and wonderful. And I can't remember a single song. And then I was like, oh, that's why recipes are important. Like someone can sit with you in your kitchen. You can show them how you make every single detail of this recipe. They can taste it along the way with you. They can be there. They can be present. And then they can go home and forget everything. And I was like, oh, this is like, this makes sense to me. So that was very clarifying for me. And I very much believe in well-written, well-tested, very thoughtfully written recipes. Like I do things like ingredients. I think about how they're listed on the package at the store. So you're not like, you know, looking at something in the book and then like, how much do I buy? Like I try to think about those things, but then also like, yeah, if you don't need the recipe, that's great. Like if you get to the point where you don't need it, like that feels really good to me. I don't know if I'm like putting myself out of business, but <laughs> anyway, those are some meandering thoughts on recipes. Thank you for the question. One thing, I, one thing I like about your recipes is that you, they are very, like I think about the best recipes as the ones that you absorb quickly enough that you mm -hmm. don't have to keep referring to them. And that's how I feel about yours. It's like the, the recipes exist so you can stop using them basically, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And that I have to say is something that I, um, I love and like, I want that to happen because I, sh you know, this book is definitely the most personal book I've written. Like there are personal stories attached to every single recipe. And my goal is for you to make them so much and love them so much that you forget where they came from. And it just becomes yours. Like it becomes Gia's kale. Like you make it enough for your friends that they're like, make that kale again with the ricotta and the mozzarella. It's so good. And it's like, I want sort of nothing to do with it. Like I want it to become your memory. But I think if you start from this very personal place, it kind of sticks a little bit more. And, uh, you know, yeah, just that feeling of connection is something I always want to achieve, but also to help you connect with other people, like take me out of it. So, yeah. 
Uh, all right, Charles says, hi, Julia. Greetings from Brooklyn. My wife and I are huge fans, obviously not my wife. Um, we are picking up your new book from our local bookstore tomorrow. Any advice on a good first recipe to start with? And I will remind everyone, signed copies, beautiful. I'm gonna like zoom in on, because your signature is just so beautiful. Um, it has a heart and everything. Yeah, um, um, but yeah, signed copies available at Left Think Books. Support local, great. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's so funny, that very sweet about the signature. My handwriting is like all over this book. So I'm, I don't know where to sign the book because I'm like, it just looks like it was printed there. Um, I don't know how to answer this question because I don't know what Charles and his wife like. So I would, if it's okay, ask Gia because there wasn't really a first recipe for me. Like they're all kind of in my head. So Gia, you have had the book you've told us some of the things you made. What was the first thing you made? Where did you start? So the first thing that I made was the green chili chicken with pinto beans mm -hmm. because the recipe said you don't have to chop anything. And, and I was like, oh, because I mean, yeah, it's it's like whatever whatever you need for your, you know, this this first meal, like whatever you're in the mood for, there will be something in here to answer the particular combination of like craving and circumstantial restriction that we're all dealing with with every dinner now. And it's like, yeah, I, I made it, did not have to chop anything, tasted as if I chopped quite a few things and <laughs> had it with I love some description. rice, with avocado and cilantro. That's and, a good first one. Else? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. If they eat chicken, that's a great place to start. And that recipe, there's a handful of recipes, and I listed which ones they were that require no chopping because I know from friends who have young kids, as you do, Gia, that when you're holding like an infant, it's hard to do that and chop at the same time. So that is why those are there. And I'm so glad to know that like that was realized in your kitchen. That makes me very happy. Instantly. <laughs> Uh, it's really hard to make a good dinner if you don't have to chop anything. Like, it's like almost like I, yeah. <laughs> it's an uh, episode of Top Chef. <laughs> uh, Samantha has a spinoff question. So, Gia, what recipe are you most excited to try that you haven't tried yet? And for you, Julia, um, so asking again if you were to tell people to start with one recipe, but asking, what do you make for Grace when she's sad? Oh. Or happy. Let's do both. <laughs> do you would you like to go first or I'll go first. I okay. so my like aspirational like like I think a kind of cooking that I now look forward to the most is like a weekday day cooking because my weeknights mm -hmm. have gotten a lot more hectic with an infant. And there is a recipe in here for everything bagel seasoned hand pies with little scrambled eggs in it, like a little breakfast calzone. And the dough, I'm not like a big, you know, like I will deal with the dough if I must, but I don't love to deal with dough, but this dough looks quite easy and like it will not punish me in various ways. So I'm very excited to make that. I am, I'm just, I'm sitting here with this like enormous grin because we did not plan this. There was no like texting. <laughs> But the is that, thing is that, that what I, you make? So it's Grace's favorite recipe in the book. And so it's what I would make for her if she's sad to try and make her happier or if she's happy to try and keep her happy. Um, and yeah, it is. I can't wait for you to make them. It's really fun because it is, you're making like a flatbread dough. You can actually use that dough to make like a homemade pizza if you want, whatever. But um, it's just, it's like flour and yogurt. And I used a mixture of all-purpose flour and whole wheat flour because I like that kind of nuttiness. But if you use all whole wheat, it gets like a little bit of like a doorstop kind of thing. Um, and yeah, filled with scrambled eggs and like you put everything bagel seasoning as Gia beautifully described. And it is like all the satisfaction of an everything bagel also combined with the satisfaction of a Hot Pocket, which is like the best thing. Mm. And you can also make a bunch like you can double the recipe and they freeze really well. So like you can, if like Paloma's sleeping for a little bit, like you can make a bunch, put them in the freezer. And then when she's not sleeping and it's hard, you can like pop one in your toaster oven. <laughs> and it's just like the best. I love that you chose those. Cause yeah, they are great. I, 
the pandemic has definitely re like reinforced the value of like the the single freezer to toaster oh. oven like item, you know, <laughs> like it's very important. I, yeah, my like two most used appliances I think are freezer and toaster oven for sure. I loved your advice of uh, freezing cookie dough because mm -hmm. I like make oh. giant batches of cookies and then I just eat them all. But mm -hmm. if I freeze some then I can have some for later and they'll be fresh yeah. cooked or fresh baked yeah. instead of like three day old, two day old. And like whatever. fantastic <laughs> use for the toaster oven because you can just pop a few in there. And you also give yourself the gift of frozen cookie dough, which is a wonderful snack. Yeah. Uh, I think Alec is going to get the last question of the evening. Alec is asking, I always come out of long cooking sessions feeling fried. Any tips for sustaining energy while cooking? Mm. Well, I, I think I have some tips, but I also just, I don't know. I don't believe so much in any like need for long cooking. I mean, things that cook a long time are wonderful. Like there's like, um, like a Ropa Vieja recipe and stuff, but that's like, you spend five minutes putting the meat in the pot, you put it in the oven and you come back a few hours later. Like that kind of long cooking, great. But like standing on your feet and cooking a ton. I mean, if you're doing it for a big group of people or something, great. Um, but I think in general, I just, I hear in this question maybe, and maybe I'm projecting and maybe this is not what is being asked, but I think people often feel like you have to spend a long time in the kitchen to make like good food. And I just don't think, that is the case. So if that is something that um, they are dealing with, I just really encourage like really simple stuff. But if you are spending a long time in the kitchen and hopefully you're enjoying it, but you are feeling a little fried, I mean, this might sound like so silly, but it's something Grace has to remind me to do all the time. Wear supportive shoes, like wear sneakers. I am like barefoot in my house always. And, but on days when I'm like preparing for, I don't know, whatever if i'm in the kitchen for a long time she's always like did you put your sneakers on and it like saves my feet and my back really important stay hydrated um also put music on or put a podcast on or switch between them like especially if you're in the kitchen alone like change that vibe and that atmosphere and you know make it sort of enjoyable and um also don't be afraid to like sit down and take a break like this morning when i was like preparing all this stuff early in the morning for the tv thing like Grace just being the wonderful, supportive, like amazing wife that she is just made me some scrambled eggs and toast and made me my coffee and was like, just put them near me and like, didn't like force me, but like just made it very possible for me to take this moment and like make sure I was taking care of myself when I was forgetting to. Um, so yeah, sit down and take a break. Like you don't have to do it all at once. It's fine to walk away and come back. All right. Well, I want to thank you both. This has been such a beautiful, incredible conversation. Um, a reminder that both books, uh, Gia's book is available for sale at Left Bank Books. Uh, we are celebrating tonight, Simply Julia. It is the book birthday. Uh, we are so incredibly happy to celebrate this book. It will be a beautiful addition to any uh, bookshelf like this uh so do run out buy a copy oven. yeah right next to the toaster oven yeah uh, not when it's on though maybe not <laughs> <laughs> not when the toaster oven is on uh, yeah but um i am so happy that you both were here this evening that we get to celebrate this day together um i am so happy for this book that it exists and that i get to cook from it um and gia thank you for leading just a Beautiful, incredible conversation. Thank you both so much. I just, I really appreciate the support all around. And Gia, is your book, did you do an audio book? It is what? Did you do an audio book of your book? Yeah, did, did you do an audio book of this book? No, no, no. But no, I I'm think like, people, should, people should listen to your book while they're cooking. I just thought of that. Oh. I'm adding on. No, I did. I did record the audiobook, and um, someone. I, you know, I have a secret sideline as a voiceover actor. So, if I toot my own horn, I will say the audiobook's pretty good. <laughs> I just, I like. Well, happy book. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. 
Yeah, I think it'd be fun to be in someone's kitchen together. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And to the audience watching, I just dropped the link for both books. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again really, really soon. Uh, we have a ton of events, so check them out. And have a great, fantastic evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.